Are you thinking of starting to read Jane Austen's novels? Because it can be a little bit overwhelming. After all, Jane Austen wrote six major novels. It's hard to tell which one is best, where should you start, and is there some list that ranks them? Well, if you're asking any of those questions, then this video is definitely for you. Because today I'm going to be breaking down her novels, tell you a little bit about each, and also give you some recommendations so you can personalize your reading to your tastes. Because I could sit here and tell you what I personally think is best, but honestly, what's the best book for you to read first has everything to do with you and really nothing to do with me. So yeah. Anyway, my name is Ellie Dashwood and this is my channel where I talk about classic literature and history. If you like either of those things, please subscribe. So today I'm going to be going through these novels based not on their publication dates, but based on how many people in the Ellie Dashwood community tab polls decided were their favorites. So I mean that's a very scientific way of ordering these books, but it does give you a little bit of taste of what other people think are the best Jane Austen books. So let's dive in with the universal favorite, not just of the Ellie Dashwood community, but also of all history since it was published, which is of course Pride and Prejudice. So you're probably at least a little bit familiar with Pride and Prejudice since it is her most famous book and it's been made into adaptations such as the one with Keira Knightley from 2005. And then of course we have the great classic of 1995's Colin Firth version from the BBC. Throughout history, from the trenches of World War I through Jane Austen's own family, has always been pretty much the majority of people's favorite. And part of that, I think, is because it is very, as Jane Austen put it herself, sparkling. She almost wonder if she made it just too happy and sparkling, but it definitely went over very well. So briefly, the storyline of Pride and Prejudice, just in case you don't know it, is it's the story of Elizabeth Bennet. And she is the headstrong daughter of a satirical country gentleman and his very silly wife. And her main life problem is the fact that she is one of five daughters. They have no fortunes. And if their father dies, they're going to end up penniless and either going out to be governesses or living on charity the rest of their life. So of course the solution to this problem is to find a rich husband. But of course the problem is, is rich guys generally want to marry rich girls. And that goes back to the whole economics of this time period. And really I actually have a whole series on the economics of Pride and Prejudice and the Regency era. So definitely check that out if you want to learn more on that topic. And so she and her sisters all need to find rich husbands, and this is not helped by the fact that her two youngest sisters are the most ridiculous flirts probably in the whole country. And that's just bringing down their overall family image. But thankfully her older sister Jane is pretty much perfect and she and Elizabeth are best friends. And so when rich gentlemen do move into the neighborhood, one of those rich gentlemen is Mr. Bingley and he thinks Jane is just the most prettiest angel on the planet. So Elizabeth is very happy about that because she agrees with him. Everyone should love Jane. But then Mr. Bingley's best friend, who's also very rich, Mr. Darcy, says that Elizabeth is not very handsome, which is their era's version of pretty. And if you want to learn more about Pride and Prejudice terms like handsome, I also have a video on that. But pretty much Mr. Darcy is proud and arrogant and nobody likes him, especially not this third guy who shows up, Mr. Wickham, who's charming and gallant and really dislikes Mr. Darcy. So overall, Pride and Prejudice is about discovering that first impressions when you meet someone are not always true. Also, Mr. Darcy's pride, getting humbled a bit, Elizabeth having big life realizations about herself, and so many other issues are talked about in Pride and Prejudice. And overall, I would recommend Pride and Prejudice to pretty much anyone. It's especially good for anyone who does love romance. Of course, whether Pride and Prejudice is a romance is a whole other topic for a different video, but it does have a love story that does play a very central role in the plot. I do love Jane Austen's romances in that it's not all about Twitter pated feelings. She really delves into the inner workings of the human heart, which is honestly one of the most complex things out there if you want to study it as a science. 
So I'd also recommend it if you're an absolute beginner, if you haven't read any of Jane Austen's works. It is a time-honored classic for a reason, because it is absolutely wonderful. And also it's relatively short compared to her other works, and so it's a good starting off point. I feel like the topics it delves into are more relatable to today. The conversation style is a lot easier to read. As for the people who should avoid Pride and Prejudice, I can't I haven't actually thought of any. I do have like long lists for some of these other books, but I couldn't really come up with one for Prime Prejudice because it is just so great. So the next up, a general favorite of everybody is Emma. Now Emma is very different from Pride and Prejudice plotline wise. You may be familiar with it because it was recently made into a movie in 2020. And of course the BBC has also put out a great mini series of it. It basically tells the story of Emma, who is the younger daughter of a country gentleman who is a hypochondriac. And her mother passed away when she was a child, so she was mostly raised by her governess, which if you want to know more about what a governess was, I do have a video on that topic, which you should check out. But the first chapter of the book sets us up for Emma's plotline this way. It says, Emma Woodhouse, handsome, clever, and rich, with a comfortable home and happy disposition, seemed to unite some of the best blessings of existence and had lived nearly 21 years in the world with very little distress or vex her. And then a little bit later it says that she essentially had the power of having rather too much her own way and a disposition to think a little too well of herself. So what does handsome, clever, slightly vain Emma do in her life? Well, she decides to use all of that to help others in the glorious pursuit of matchmaking. That's right, she's going to find love for everyone around her. And after it working twice, in her opinion, she is ready for a third time. Now, she has this good family friend named Mr. Knightley. He's actually her brother-in-law's older brother, also one of their kind of next door neighbors. And he's like, Emma, this is a horrible idea. You can't play with people like dolls. Stop trying to match make people. And Emma's like, you do not know what you're talking about. I'm going to match make this couple I've set my mind on and it will be glorious. Well, do you think it's really gonna end up glorious? But basically that's what Emma's about. It's about how well do you really know yourself and how sometimes even if you have the best of intentions, sometimes things can turn out terribly wrong. And again, it goes into so many other things, but this video can only be so long. So there's that too. So who is this book best for? All of the Emmas in the world. A lot of people find Emma super relatable. I know I do. I have friends who do because it's true. Like you want to do your best and help people Sometimes it falls apart. That's not great, but she is uber relatable. Next up, I think you'd appreciate this book if you really love like true gentlemanly men, because I feel like Mr. Knightley really is the definition of a gentleman in the book. And there's of course a very sweet romance that happens there. Also, if you really like character driven stories versus plot driven stories, I think you'll like Emma because it very much is about inner realizations and small moments versus, you know, there's she's not going on some quest to discover the Holy Grail or something. This is not a plot driven book. It's very much character driven. Now you might want to avoid this if you hate long books. Emma is a lot, lot longer than Pride and Prejudice and sometimes it can seem a little bit slow going if you're used to faster paced books. Also avoid it if you hate anybody like Emma. Like I feel like Emma is a hate or love person and Jane Austen herself said that she was going to write a heroine that nobody but herself liked. Now obviously that's not true. So many people love Emma but some people don't if you're one of those people and like just from hearing about her you're like I already hate that girl. Don't read Emma. Next up the community's third favorite is Persu. Persuasion. Now Persuasion is actually the last complete novel that Jane Austen wrote before she died and it was actually published after her death. 
And for all of you who like shorter books, it is one of her shorter books. What is Persuasion about? So it tells the story of Anne Elliot, and she's 27 years old and still unmarried, and her family has pretty much given up hope that she'll make a great match because her beauty is faded. And one of the reasons her beauty is faded so early is because she's so depressed over her long lost love. When she was a teenager, she had this brilliant, glorious romance, and then had to break it off because he was poor and her family didn't approve. Yeah, it's rough stuff here. But then guess what happens? Since that time, he went and made a fortune in the Navy, and now he's very rich. So this just makes everything worse. And then on top of it, he moves into her neighborhood. That is correct. He shows up in her neighborhood, and that's so much drama. But because it's like, can they rekindle their love? Is she going to have to watch him marry someone else, even though she's still totally in love with him? The questions are real. But that's pretty much what persuasion is about. It talks a lot about the workings of the heart again, long lost love, constancy, and all of that. And it is a great book. Now, who is this best for? I think people who are really romantic would love persuasion. It does come off as I feel like deeply felt and passionate. Now, I would say avoid persuasion if you prefer your love stories to be all flashy and sparkling. In that case, definitely go read Pride and Prejudice. I feel like persuasion is sort of more like this deep undertow of emotions and regret and love and loss and all of that stuff. So next up is Sense and Sensibility. It was actually Jane Austen's first novel that she got published. Sense and Sensibility tells the story of the Dashwood sisters and their mother after the dad of the family dies and their older half-brother pretty much leaves them out financially in the cold to make it on their own. So they have to move from their big country house into a small cottage on a generous relative's land. The book really focuses on the two oldest daughters of the family, Eleanor and Mary Ann. And what they do is they personify sense and sensibility because there was this sort of debate going on in society of the time over the balance of the two. So I think in our modern era, we're pretty familiar with this concept of sense, of being sensible, sticking to the rules, thinking things out logically, having good etiquette. And then there's sensibility, which actually was this concept of having strong emotions and appreciating the beautiful and the majestic and poetry and just really having a lot of feelings. English literature was sort of going through this ultimate emo phase at the time. Literally, like, wow, I was listening to poetry and it was so overwhelming with its majestic qualities that I fainted. Like that was the pinnacle. Like if you could have that strong emotional reaction to poetry, you were very refined in your sensibility. And so with Eleanor, we see her representing this logical good sense and Marianne is this strongly felt sensibility. Anyway, Jane Austen uses these two characters and their reactions to the romance that does happen in the book to demonstrate and how much they should really play into our decision-making processes. So who is the book best for? I feel like it's really good if you're interested in the heart versus head debate. And Jane Austen was definitely weighing in on that here. I would say to avoid sense and sensibility if you really love gripping romances, because I feel like of all of Jane Austen's novels in Sense and Sensibility, the male leads are highly underdeveloped. And I think part of that is because she was so focused on the sisters and the debate she was playing out with them that the male leads were almost there just as catalysts to examine the women's behaviors and thought patterns. Also avoid it if you want a book that's really easy to understand in modern terms. I think of all the books, Sense and Sensibility, because it's delving into this debate, uses a lot of language that is not easily understood today. Because during the time, everyone would have understood this debate, but now a lot of those words and those concepts are lost. Just like a lot of people don't even know the meaning of sensibility in Sense and Sensibility, the title. And so it just kind of goes with the whole book. Now, I am going to say this, which I don't know, a lot of people are probably going to disagree with me, which is that if you do want to have it 
easier to understand and definitely more romantic version of Sense and Sensibility, watch BBC's 2008 version <laughs> because I feel like they definitely in the screenplay were able to make the male characters a lot more interesting and all of that. So next up is Northanger Abbey. So actually Northanger Abbey is the first book Jane Austen ever sold for publication, but the publisher did not publish it and it took years until it was published after her death along with Persuasion. But really what it was was Jane Austen's response to this sort of gothic age of sensibility literature that was very popular at the time when she was growing up. In particular, in this book, she discusses a book called The Mysteries of Udolpho. And of course, The Mysteries of Udolpho, and I feel like overall a lot of this literature would just be explained again by literature was going through a teenage gothic period of their life. It's just like so many emotions, but also goth, goth emotions. We need terrible castles with hidden secrets in the macabre and just, well, also fainting with emotions. And so they really were going through a emotional gothic period of life. And this is Jane Austen's response to that. It's a little bit of satire. It's an examining, of course, again, of the human heart. So the basic plot line is that Catherine Moreland is a young lady and she loves reading these dramatic novels and they fill her head with so many romantic notions and she wants to go have adventure. But she's also stuck in the country where it's kind of boring and she's like, has all these younger siblings and yeah. And Catherine just doesn't have any of those trademark stamps of being a heroine of her own story. Like, you know, all her parents are alive. Nobody locks her up or beats her. She's just terribly uninteresting, you know? But then something dramatic happens called her neighbors are going to go to Bath, which is sort of this health resort town where gouty elderly gentlemen try to go and get well. And this nice elderly couple invites her to go with them. And so she's super excited because Bath also has quite the social scene and dances and fashion going on. So she's like, this is it. This is my chance to be a heroine of my own story. And so she goes to Bath and she goes to the assembly rooms where they have balls. She doesn't know anybody. And that's kind of dumb because you have to know people to dance with people. And anyway, it's not the best life ever. But eventually while they're in Bath, she makes two sets of friends. One is the brother-sister combo of Isabella and John Thorpe. And the other is Henry Tilney and his sister, Eleanor. So she has these two sets of friends, but are they true friends? Who knows? And I feel like that's one of the main themes we see in Northanger Abbey is what is true friendship? But Henry Tilney and his dad invites her to come stay with them at Northanger Abbey. So of course Northanger Abbey is their house because after the monasteries were all closed because King Henry broke with the Pope, some of them were sold off or given off as houses to people. And so that's how Northanger Abbey is now a house because it is. But its name is super dramatic. The fact that it's this old abbey is super dramatic. Super dramatic stuff has to happen there, right? Well, does it? So of course, Northanger Abbey explores imagination versus reality. It also delves into true crimes of the heart and that sort of stuff. So who is Northanger Abbey best for? I think anyone who loves gothic stuff or mysteries would love it for obvious reasons. Because once she gets to Northanger, there's kind of a mystery there. I'm just gonna say that. And then also I feel like it's a shorter book. So again, anyone who loves shorter reads. Also people who love Henry Tilney, which I know like, you won't know if you love Henry Tilney till you read this book, but he does have, I think one of the most dedicated fan followings of Jane Austen's. He understands novels and fashion. I mean, you can't get better than that, right? Yeah, but I feel like there really is that sort of like very cute, sweet romance there. Now, who should avoid Northanger Abbey? I think the number one thing I've just seen from people's responses is if you hate naive people. Now, a lot of people think Catherine is super relatable. I am one of them. The first time I ever read Northanger Abbey, I was like, did Jane Austen know me as a teenager? How did she write a book about me? But at the same time, I've seen so many people be like, I hate Catherine. She's so naive. This is ridiculous. And so if you hate naive people, don't read Northanger Abbey. Mansfield Park comes in last on this, but it's still a lot of people's favorite book. It is really long, which I think may be 
one reason it's not a lot of people's favorite because maybe some people don't read Mansfield Park because it's so long so they don't have an opportunity to realize that it is very great. Anyway, I think it is very underrated because it is brilliant. So Mansfield Park tells the story of Fanny Price and Fanny Price is a poor girl who has rich relatives because her mother married beneath her aka her mom was not very smart and married a poor guy and then her life has been ruined but her rich relatives take pity on Fanny and they bring her to their big estate called Mansfield Park and raise her along with her cousins now she's raised with four cousins, two boys, and two girls. And of the two boys, her cousin Edmund is very nice to her and they become best friends and she loves him a lot. And her life is tolerable at Mansfield Park, except for the fact that she's constantly petrified and verbally abused by her aunt Norris, who's not actually the aunt that took her in, but another aunt that lives nearby. Anyway, tons of family dynamics are playing into the story here. Anyway, so Fanny grows up amongst them. And then of course, all of these cousins and Fanny hit that age when romance and stuff starts happening. And right about this time, a brother and sister move into the neighborhoods the Crawfords. And everybody loves them. They're cool, they're fashionable, they're charming. Except for Fanny. Fanny's like, I think these people are bad news. Nobody listens to me. And then of course, they are catalysts into exploring so many different types of themes, including what's more important, morals or fashion, being charming or being just. And just so, so, so much stuff here. I think Mansfield Park is best for people who really are interested in character studies and of course the human heart and morality and understanding how those play out. Again, we go into what is real, what is really important and all of those topics. Now, who is Mansfield Park not the best for? Again, it's really long. If you don't like really long books, probably not read it. Also, if verbal abuse is triggering to you for any reason, Mrs. Norris in the book is awful. I'm just gonna say that. If you're looking for like super passionate romance, you're not gonna find it. I feel like it's a whole different type of romance that we see happening in Mansfield Park. And then two, I would say the last one is don't read it if you don't like Fanny, which is a whole, again, one of those things of like, how will I know if I don't? So I'm just gonna tell you, but Fanny is Jane Austen's most unliked heroine throughout, I think, most of history since it was published because people think she's a stuck-up prig. They think she's overly self-righteous, that she's no fun at all. They think that she just, yeah, needs to chill out, party more. And I have to say, I personally love Fanny. I know a lot of people love her, also relate to her a lot, but there is the other set that just really hates Fanny. So if you love reading about party people, if you're not really into sort of like super strict morality and stuff, then Fanny might not be for you. And if Fanny's not for you, the Mansfield Park might not be for you since she is literally the main character of Mansfield Park. So you see a lot of her. So that's been Jane Austen's six major novels and my recommendations for which ones you might wanna read based upon your own preferences. And if you are just starting to get into Jane Austen, then definitely try to choose one that's right for you and also subscribe to my channel because this is where I really help try to explain the culture and the ways of Jane Austen's England so that you can understand the books better because some of the things are kind of really hard to understand like the economics and the customs so definitely subscribe if you're interested in learning more have an awesome day bye my hair now okay now that looks weirder what's happening with my hair nobody knows Okay, I'm just, wow. Okay, I should have left it on. Now I look like Isaac Newton and I don't even know why. Okay, we're just gonna go with this. Why does this keep getting bigger? Okay, moving on.